Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for attending today's webinar. We will begin uh, very shortly, in approximately one minute. Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's webinar uh, titled Measuring Before Migration Drove Car Rentals .com Success. My name is George Sleshner. I'm the lead partner solution architect for global system integrators at Amazon Web Services. And I'll be uh, your host today and the uh, moderator for today's presentation. Uh, first of all, I will start by going over, you know, very quickly some uh, important reminder. Uh, when you join today's webinar, you selected to join by either phone call or your computer audio. So if uh, for any reason you would like to change your audio selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in the control panel. Also, from the control panel, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions in the chat box. Uh, we will collect those questions and uh, address as many as we can during the Q&A session um, at the end of the presentation. And also, uh, very importantly, there, there is a, a brief survey so please stay connected at the end of the presentation to, um, you know, to submit your feedback as your opinion count. And lastly, you know, the PowerPoint presentation will be uh, available through uh, SlideShare along with uh, the recording of the webinar on YouTube. So we'll send you that, you know, our email uh, within two to three days after today's presentation. So keep an eye for the follow-up email, uh, the address that you provided, obviously. So again, welcome everyone to today's live webinar. Uh, my name is George Leshner. Uh, I'm the partner solution architect lead for the global system integrator at Amazon Web Services, and I'll be your host today and the moderator. So in addition to learning about AWS, we also hear from Neil McGowan, who is the EMEA Director of Digital Intelligence at New Relic, and Frank Dornberger, who is a senior system engineer at carrental.com. And uh, today you learn about the AWS uh, migration approach, Just provide a quick overview on that, and then how to accelerate cloud adoption and customer transformation, and a real example of a cloud journey from uh, a customer. And a reminder, please post your question in the chat box throughout this presentation, and we will review those at the end of uh, today's event. So, let's begin.
so I'll say you know, today's agenda will cover you know, a quick migration overview from AWS, and then I'll hand over to Neil to cover uh, the part about accelerating cloud adoption and cloud transformation. And then Frank will cover and provide you know, the, the cloud journey of carrental.com, and then we'll close with a Q&A session. So, the first thing you know I want to talk about is obviously what are the common driver for uh, getting customer to migrate to uh, AWS. So from talking to customer, because as you know, you know our approach is really working backwards. Everything starts from the customer. So from talking to them, the common you know factor that really stir customer to uh, to want to migrate to AWS are things like. Uh, you know, acquisitions, divestiture, uh, or divestiture, sorry, um, maybe some facility and real estate, decision, co-location, and what they really to achieve, it's, you know, cost reduction, um, digital transformation, innovate, uh, data center consolidation, and, and so forth. So these are really, you know, the common driver that, you know, uh, uh, push customer to want to, uh, to move to AWS. I mean, we, we can talk about more, but obviously they are tightly related to those the, those one. And then of course, there's always some challenges, right? They, 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 here we've uh, captured some potential barrier from talking to customer. Uh, for example, you know, what do you do with uh, all the CapEx investment that you already made? Uh, what do you do with that? Um, and uh, what's going to happen uh, with, you know, the services, the end user, the customer, um, given that the application ecosystem is very complex, the architecture, the interdependency, you know, is it not going to uh, disrupt the service? Uh, what will be the impact of the downtime during the migration? Uh, and, and of course, you know, you always come across, uh, across uh, a uh, very skeptical uh, stakeholder for various reasons. It could be political, uh, past experience, and uh, those who are very cautious, they don't want to be the first to migrate and so forth. And, and also, you know, the expense. And, and, and another key issue is also, you know, the lack of uh, uh, cloud expertise, you know, uh, internal. So all those could be a, a barrier to, uh, to migrate into the cloud. Now, you know, at, at AWS, we uh, have these four core components um, that are part of our AWS migration pro uh, process. So the first thing is really to have a solid business case uh, and then, you know, involve the right people across different organizations and then the right process in a met methodical way, uh, migration. And then, you know, we'll cover, we we'll dive deep into those, uh, the six common migration strategies. So I'm going to, you know, dive deep into those in the, you know, following slide. So the business case, it, it's really a key, right? Um, you want to make sure that, you know, you have enough data to be able to, uh, to really convince the business that in fact, this you know, there's no need. If you have the right data, then uh, everything will be clear to everyone, really. So you've got to do like a cost analysis, you know, be able to compare AWS run costs with the current operating models. This is this is a pretty straightforward exercise. Um, well, in capturing the data requires obviously using tools, but um, in terms of what, what once you get the actual data. And then you present that to, uh, to the business. I think it will be um, pretty easy to make informed decision based on that. Uh, the cost of change, you know, what what will be the cost of, uh, you know, the consulting, bringing partners, and so forth, and uh, ma maintaining legacy environment till the migration is complete. Because obviously, business need to go on. Um, what about you know business value? Uh, what the expected return investment 
and the time to uh, to deployment, decommissioning access, and the level of productivity. These are really the key thing that will make you know, a solid business case. And then the next point, which is also very important, it's uh, the people and the organization. Right? So you've got to think about forming a, a CCOE, a cloud center of excellence, uh, to be able to establish operational processes and uh, to mobilize the appropriate resources. And as I say, you've got to make sure that you involve the right people across the different business segments so that everyone knows what's going on and is comfortable with, uh, you know, with uh, the migration and they can provide input, they feel you know, engaged, they feel involved into that project. And uh, you know, defining best practice and put you know, some governance uh, to be able to uh, automate the discovery, drive change. You know, these are you know, the kind of thing that you need to address. In order to do that, you have to make sure they have the right, pe the right people. So who will be the who has going to be the CEO, CCOE members to develop subject matter expertise, you know, as the migration evolves. You know? So th these are really key people and organization. And the next, you know, uh, point is obviously the process, right? So you've got to make sure that you know you have the process. Now, AWS, you've got the migration, the preparation phase, and obviously move on to discovery and planning. And then we iterate through um, application design, migration, validation, and obviously uh, operate. So th this really helps to visualize the cloud adoption effort from planning to uh, operating on AWS. A and then you know that takes us to uh, you know the six common um, migration strategies, right? Um, obviously, the first one is uh, pretty straightforward: lift, lift and shift. You rehost what you already have in on-prem into the cloud. Um, you know, sometimes there is a need uh, to re-platform uh, if you're running some uh, some uh, AIX or some uh, you know um, application or OS that you cannot uh, run on, on the cloud, and perhaps you can. You know, re-platform that run it on Linux. So what do you do with mainframe and so forth? And you can also look at repurchasing. You know, if you already have, uh, if you have uh, some services and there's equivalent on on, on SaaS uh, SaaS uh, um, offering, then you can go for that to be able to align with uh, the cloud uh, 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 cost model uh, without you know um, losing uh, the actual uh, service quality. Uh, and uh, that you provide to your customer, basically. Uh, you can also refactor uh, your application or retain and retire. So these are really, you know, the, the, the six common migration strategies. And, and it, it's important to actually mention that there's no one size fits all approach to migration your application. It's really depend on the, and it's on a case by case basis. And, and obviously, um, at AWS, we have a large ecosystem of partner, you know, who can actually take you through that journey uh, and working in collaboration with, uh, you know, our AWS professional services, uh, the solutions that are available in the marketplace to help you determine your migration strategy and develop a contingency plan, which is really important because it's a, it's a critical uh, period, but then business need to go on, right? You don't want the business to be, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to be interrupted because of the migration to the cloud. And uh, a very clear roadmap to help you achieve your desire and state on the cloud, uh, keep your workforce focused on business innovation and, and change management. Uh, and, and then obviously visualize the entire migration effort timeline and reduce costs. So, talking about partner, um, I would like to, uh, you know, introduce uh, uh, Neil McGowan, who is uh, the MIA director of digital intelligence from New Relic, who is going to, uh, you know, tell us, uh, you know, what uh, some of the things that they've done uh, um, in terms of accelerating cloud adoption 
and the customer transformation. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, George. Um, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to talk to you all about how New Relic is helping our customers adopt the cloud faster uh, and ultimately transform their businesses. So I just want to take a few minutes uh, to talk about some of our experience um, with our customers in this space uh, and then hand over to Frank, who's going to give you a first hand account of how um, New Relic and AWS have helped car rentals uh, transform their organization and their customer experience. Um, so, first of all, what I'd like to do is to just talk about the, um, uh, the climate today. Um, and digital transformation is a, uh, is a hot topic. Uh, everybody's talking about it. Um, everybody is doing it in some way or should be doing it in some way uh, because the world is changing. Uh, the way that we interact with our suppliers, whoever they may be, whether it's um, you know, the people that are selling us train tickets or accommodation or our banks or you know, the, uh, the, the pizzas that we order to um, feed our, uh, our DevOps teams. Um, the way that we interact with all of those organizations uh, is changing. No longer is it um, face to face or even over the phone. If you look at Domino's as an example, 80% of their business comes through digital channels. So if those channels are closed, um, then typically they're closed. Uh, similarly, you know, Ryanair, um, you know, they, they're quoted as saying years ago they used to be an airline with a website, now they're a digital business that happens to operate a few planes because if their digital channels don't work, then they can't sell seats. Um, so the promise, if you get it right, is huge. Um, there's massive potential uh, to um, gain a market share, to dominate markets, uh, and so on. Um, but the, um, the, ch the challenges are real in such a fast-changing world. Um, if you listen to InfoWorld, you know, one in three cloud projects this year will fail. Um, if you talk to Constellation Research, you know, 50% of uh, Fortune 500 companies will be bankrupt or, or are bankrupt since uh, um, the year 2000. So the, the key players, um, they're either um, changing uh, and transforming to try and meet the new expectations uh, of our um, consumers, uh, or they're being bought uh, or emerging uh, in order to transform their businesses. Um, and if you listen to um, uh, people in, in the know when it comes to transforming businesses, um, if, for example, you, you listen to Gene King, uh, the author of the DevOps Handbook, one of the key attributes that organizations need is speed and agility in order to win or dominate their marketplaces. And every day that goes by, um, things are moving faster and faster. So cloud um, is an enabler for that speed and agility. Um, in a recent survey, 2017 Rightscale um, uh, State of the Cloud report, if you looked at the benefits that customers were expecting to receive uh, from uh, moving to the cloud, adopting cloud services. The top eight uh, are focused really around speed and agility, uh, extending their reach into um, uh, different geographies, uh, faster time to market, et cetera. Uh, and it's only really as you start to get down to the, the lower end of the top 10 that you see things like cost efficiencies, cost savings, et cetera. Um, and that's because the people are being um, pushed towards adopting agile technologies that enable them to uh, get out there faster with their innovative um, solutions. So this is where New Relic um, uh, comes in. Uh, we've been helping customers for the past 10 years uh, make that step um, to move faster with confidence. We've been helping them um, deliver disruptive technologies, uh, the likes of you know, Airbnb, Ocado, et cetera, Ryanair, where they're actually transforming the market altogether. Um, and we've been helping global enterprises uh, move into the, the digital space, um, whether it's in financial services, whether it's in manufacturing, et cetera, um, and be able to deliver the innovation that's required in order to move um, their businesses forward. Um, and just to highlight that, I mean, we as an organization, we've got over 17,000 customers worldwide, um, and we're helping those customers 
and move faster with confidence. So much so that uh, approximately 45% of all of the application instances that New Relic manages for our customers are in the AWS cloud. Um, and that's a, that's a really significant number. It shows how uh, organizations are adopting the cloud to move uh, into the digital space uh, and to transform their businesses and meet their uh, market demands. As a result of managing those environments, we scale as well. So we are, we're um, capturing from our customers somewhere in the region of 2 billion events or metrics per minute into our cloud um, to help them manage those dynamic environments which are supporting their businesses. So what is it that New Relic does? Uh, I, I appreciate there may be some people on the call that under, uh, have um, come across New Relic before, um, but there may be some that have never heard of New Relic. Um, well, at its foundation, uh, New Relic is a, a SaaS platform that enables customers to manage the full end-to-end -end experience of their business applications that are supporting their core or key business uh, processes uh, and meeting the demands of their consumers. Um, we have uh, a number of products that fall into that platform. Um, at the center is uh, New Relic APM, which is where uh, we came from, which is the ability to automatically instrument applications at runtime um, so that we can see into the code that's executing uh, and see where time is being spent, see where errors are being generated, and understand how the application is performing in meeting the demands of the business. But then we can extend that visibility into um, the front end, the end user perspective. So um, what's the performance like on a, a, um, a native mobile application? Uh, is it crashing? Is it uh, transacting as we would expect? Um, what's the experience for every user that accesses our application via a browser? What do they see? Uh, and are they able to complete their uh, business process? And to proactively monitor those applications as well, uh, to check that if we're making changes, um, have we changed something that may impact users even when users aren't on the site through synthetic monitoring? Uh, and then reaching back into the infrastructure and the back end that's supporting that, um, we can look at the, uh, the hosts um, that are uh, running those applications, whether those be physical, virtual, or um, in a, a cloud. Um, we can look at the cloud services which are being consumed in order to deliver those applications and understand the performance of those in the full context of the end-to-end -end business process. And then we deliver that on a scalable platform in the cloud to allow people to visualize um, the overall performance, to gain intelligence and insights into what's happening in terms of their business and their applications that support it, and to trigger alerts based upon that information so that they can take action uh, uh, to either resolve issues faster, to prevent issues from happening in the first place, or even in a lot of cases with our customers, uh, action which drives a, a business um, decision around uh, things like, you know, do we need to uh, um, uh, hold a marketing campaign because it's having a neg negative impact, uh, or do we need to look at um, pricing our, our seats differently uh, in order to drive the, the business revenue that we're expecting. So New Relic has this platform um, that allows us to capture an awful lot of data and to analyze that data in real time and to present it back to consumers. Um, but what we tend to do now is we tend to focus on the key initiatives that organizations are facing right now. And, and we see three key initiatives in the market. We see cloud adoption uh, as being a, a huge initi initiative. The vast majority of the customers that we speak to are either in the cloud, on a journey to the cloud, or thinking about the cloud. Um, so this is one initiative where we can definitely help them with the experience that we have. The other initiative uh, as part of transforming a business is transforming the culture and the way that the, org the organization operates, um, and this is DevOps. Uh, how do we deliver things faster? How do we continue to innovate at a pace which is um, demanded by our consumers? So we can definitely help organizations there. And the third key initiative is the digital customer experience. What customers want from their providers, from their service providers, um, is uh, a, an enriched, uh, performant, available 
uh, anytime, anywhere experience? Uh, and how do you go about delivering that uh, exceptional experience um, on a day-to-day -day basis? What we're going to do today is we're going to focus on the cloud adoption side of things. And this is where New Relic brings together its people, its product, its sales and its services to address uh, this key initiative for our customers. So um, the common tale that you see from a cloud migration perspective is that uh, organizations say, um, we don't need to monitor it until it's in the cloud. We're moving it um, from on-premise to the cloud. So why, do we, why should we monitor it where it is? We'll monitor it when we get into the cloud. Um, and this is a common mistake uh, because what typically happens is as part of the migration, things don't necessarily go to plan. Uh, and this is where, in a lot of cases, New Relic has been brought in in the past to try and diagnose what's going wrong, to try and understand why it's not working the way that we expect. Um, and actually, realistically, the, the place where it should be deployed um, is in the plan phase. Earlier instrumentation to discover what needs to be migrated uh, and also to understand um, what the current state is before uh, moving into the cloud. So migration done right um, from a New Relic perspective uh, is to be able to plan migrate and run and along the way capture the right metrics which help you make informed decisions so on the plan phase it's about baselining it's about understanding what the current state is if you don't understand the current state how can you validate whether things have got better or worse uh, on the migration phase it's about um, understanding whether or not you're still delivering the level of service that you would expect um, the functionality that you would expect uh, identifying issues or bottlenecks that occur uh, during that process. And then on the run phase, as we're going to hear about with car rentals shortly, it's about once you're there, how do you continue to optimize uh, from a, uh, a cost perspective uh, in terms of making sure you're getting the most from your investment in those cloud services, but also how do you capitalize on some of the unique services that are offered there to refactor your applications and to drive performance improvements. So what does that look like? very quickly uh, before we hear from car rentals. If we take one of those stages uh, in the plan phase, application baselining is key. Understand what the performance is, what the customer experience is before you migrate so that you have a benchmark from which you can compare things moving forward. Um, we, we all make these decisions to, to migrate, to move, because we want to make things better. We certainly don't want to make them worse. So unless you have a clear understanding of what the current state is, you you're not in a position to be able to measure that. In the migration phase, um, it's about acceptance testing. It's about ensuring that everything is working the way that you would expect, um, whether it's from a you know, availability perspective, uh, load time, throughput, so scalability, uh, resource consumption, et cetera, um, is the application that we've migrated delivering what we expect uh, from a business perspective. And then finally, on the run phase, uh, it's about refactoring those applications to get the most out of the environment that you're now deployed in, to get the, the best value for money, to deliver the best possible service from a performance availability and scalability perspective uh, to your customers, and to allow you to capitalize on those services to continue to innovate. So, New Relic provides one platform for that entire journey. It gives you the, the full end-to-end -end visibility. It enables you to prioritize the right apps uh, to migrate first. It enables you to um, uh, refactor those applications to drive um, the best possible optimizations uh, and ultimately transform uh, your business. So um, if there's one way of summing it up, basically visibility gives innovation the speed that you require. The earlier you instrument, the greater visibility you get, the easier your migrations become, and ultimately the faster you can migrate. So the earlier you instrument, the faster you can go. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to hand over to Frank, um, Frank Dornberger from carrentals.com. Uh, Frank's a senior systems engineer. Uh, at Car Rentals. He's been with them uh, for around about 11 years uh, and over the past four years he's been using New Relic and AWS together and I'd like uh, um, Frank to share his experiences with you um, and, uh, and then we'll be open for questions at the end of the session. Thank you.
Um, thank you, Neil. Good morning, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Um, so in contrast to um, New Relic and AWS, you may not be familiar with um, car rentals. Sorry, that was one too. too free. Um, car rentals is actually um, part of Expedia Group, fully owned the three brands, car rentals, Autoscape and Cardemar since 2014. Um, we sell a car rental, as the name already suggests, and insurance products during your journey. Um, currently, we have uh, around 1.5 million customers on peak days um, with, with searches uh, being done. And uh, these result in rate roughly 18 million supply searches during these peak days. And in total, we see um, around about 3 million bookings a year. Um, we have an agency model for our US customers and the merchant of record um, business model for the European and uh, Asian market. And the majority of our customers come actually from Europe and North America, um, as I've already mentioned. Um, now, we've adopted the cloud and you may ask why. Uh, we had critical um, voices, um, as George mentioned, um, why should we go to the cloud? Uh, things are working on premise. Um, we don't have any cloud expertise. Why should we go there? Um, it may just um, boost our cost without any benefits. We may just fail and um, send a lot of money down the drain. Uh, but then on the other hand, we had many arguments that were talking in favor of the cloud, like the fact that we had five different uh, data centers uh, owned by the three brands back in 2014. And none of these data centers was big enough to host the load um, of the three brands that just came together. Um, so consolidating data center in any of the current um, data centers was just not possible. Um, and provisioning new infrastructure in any of them would have taken way too long um, for the speed that we wanted to have to start consolidation. Um, also, the on-premise solutions that we had don't scale well uh, with the goal that Car Rentals has to uh, power the other brands of Expedia Group and um, some other big brands out in the market. Um, and therefore, future proving would have been um, a major um, consumption of our uh, capex, and therefore um, it didn't seem to be the right fit as well. While the cloud scales with your needs in terms of costs. Um, another benefit is that the cloud offers many services um, without you having to purchase um, big licenses and eventually you will never use it, or um, expensive hardware such as uh, telephony systems um, just for having eventually maybe three calls a day. Um, therefore, um, since we also have a culture of test and learn rapidly, uh, the cloud seemed to be the environment in which car rentals wants to be uh, in the future. And this is how our journey started. Um, after we had our first steps into the cloud, this is the intermittent uh, data center topology that we had. Still, we had uh, physical data centers, two of them in Germany, one in France. Uh, we had, as you can see, all the uh, orangey um, ellipses are still on-premise solutions uh, or at least third-party managed uh, applications um, and as you can see in two of the data centers uh, we were in addition to the cloud we had to deal with PCI compliance uh, because we capture credit card data right there and throughout the journey um, of the cloud migration this is how our topology looked once complete um, we only have one PCI zone, as you can see in the um, upper right green bubble, where we capture credit cards. So our PCI footprint became way smaller. Our audits are a bliss by now. And um, we live in the cloud exclusively since April this year. Um, no on-premise solution are anymore in place. We are uh, fully cloud-based. Um, we've not only changed our infrastructure, but over the time as well, how our applications work. On the left side, you see the uh, monolithic applications that we had in um, one of our on-premise data centers. It was a PHP-based, gigantic um, software that had a 
bunch of functionalities they were all working but it was a lot of spaghetti code it was hard to maintain uh, we had development cycles of um, many weeks uh, with intense manual testing which made it a pain to maintain um, bit by bit we broke that down into microservices which you can see in the right section um, and we are not ju just php based anymore but we use uh, ember in the front end we use a lot of java and still php in the back end we use some node.js and some ruby as well and uh, every service um, has its decreed discrete functionality and um, does no longer negatively interfere the code of the other applications um, and as a result of that, um, as you can see in the slide, we run 18 microservices, uh, AWS based by now, we were able to push our conversion by 20% in the German market. And we dropped the search for our US customers down from four seconds to nearly three seconds. So we gained almost a second um, solely by breaking it down into smaller applications that interact better with each other. Um, the approach we took to the cloud, um, if you remember the examples from George, is lift and shift. So basically, um, the example I present here is how we approach databases. We had uh, on-premise uh, Postgres SQL databases in uh, our French data center. And what we did, we transformed uh, EC2 instances uh, into databases solely by installing Postgres into it. We migrate the content over there and we have a cloud-based um, database which acted similar to our on-premise database. Once we were comfortable with the quality and how it worked and how it performed and um, we took another step and instead of owning an EC2 instance in which we install Postgres, we migrated it to a database as a service uh, by adopting Amazon RDS. Um, so we did a cloud-to-cloud -cloud migration um, instead of owning our hardware, we um, just use the databases as a service. And then the next step is um, we use Aurora, which is the ability to cluster Postgres, which on-premise is hard to achieve, if at all. And um, the next step, once available by AWS, will be um, a serverless database which means that the database scales to load, load automatically without us needing to think prior to provisioning the database, how busy it will be, how many requests a second it will get, um, how big the underlying um, hard disk has to be. Um, that's the service not yet available, but once it comes, this will be a next iteration of um, solely improving our databases over time. Now, um, here are some figures of an application that we migrated to the cloud um, earlier this year in April. Um, it was an application that was um, consisting of uh, a backend, a frontend, it had databases, it had caches. Um, it's basically a full, full stack application. On the middle column, you will see the, the values we captured through New Relic with our on-premise solution. The average transactions run by this application took about 450 milliseconds. Once we migrated this stack to the cloud, we were down to 20 milliseconds. We saved up to 95% in the average duration of that app solely by putting the app into the cloud. Our slowest 5% of the transactions came down for nearly 12 seconds to below one second, which is another 92% uh, of time saved there. And our database queries, uh, although they were already in the two digit millisecond um, range, we still brought them down from nearly 30 milliseconds down to 12 milliseconds. Another almost 60% of time saved solely by moving what we had into the cloud this is with zero optimization it is just pushing an entire stack from on-premise to the cloud the work that um, has been done here was done by three engineers over the course of five to six weeks one focusing on uh, the cloud adoption of the application itself uh, one built a deploy pipeline and the third one um, took care of the underlying infrastructure 
Um, New Relic also offers um, a deployment history and with it we were able to spot um, a bad deployment. If you can see the orange figure in the middle part, our error rate jumped from below 0.1% up to 2.2%. Um, as you may see in the revision um, column on the right hand side, um, if you go further up in that line, we rolled back to revision 21.1.1 within 13 minutes. So as a result of our deployment not being well, we just rolled back um, and then two hours later, two and a half hours later, we pushed out a fixed version of 21.1.2, which no longer had that error and our error rates uh, remain stable. This is something that we would very likely have slipped um, without New Relic because it was an edge case scenario in which um, the error rate jumped and it actually killed certain sales. But due to the fact that we had New Relic installed, we were able to easily spot it and fix it. Another um, good thing about New Relic, as you may see here, is that the error rate um, in the arrow that, that is pointing downwards was brought down from an average of roughly 1% down to 0.1%, uh, solely by looking at the errors that New Relic captures and figuring out what they are. Um, so we were reducing our error rate, which only was at roughly 1%, way down solely by looking at what New Relic captures as errors, um, which is a task that our engineers do regularly to just figure out if they introduce new errors. Um, and the horizontal line that you can see is the actual deployment. So the, the error rate was uh, pushed down by this deployment. Um, here you see what happened um, in a database migration. Um, and one thing that I would like to mention, we don't measure databases by New Relic. We don't have New Relic agents on our databases because we use RDS and there we cannot instrument um, these databases. But you will see throughout the next slides that we still capture a lot of database um, data in New Relic solely by having the agents instrumented in our applications. So what happens? We updated Postgres from version 9.4 to 9.6. As you can see in the upper left corner, our CPU utilization jumped from roughly 15% in the range of 50 to 100% um, as a result of patching the database. Um, if you can look in the lower right part, you can see that also our application suffered and it's the Postgres part that jumped by a massive amount. Um, having a closer look at what is happening on a database level in your Relic, mentioning again, we don't monitor, uh, we don't have an agent installed that monitors our databases. This is solely captured from the application agent. Uh, we could see that the, the green and the red um, sections that you see in this graph uh, were inexistent prior to um, the patching process, but suddenly the, something took time that prior never took time. So having a look at what those were, we figured out that two tables suddenly took massively longer uh, to be queried than before. Um, we were able to um, bring down the CPU load and the application um, execution time back to normal level solely by re-indexing um, these two tables. And as you can see in the upper left part, the, the re-index of the first table halved the CPU um, time and re-indexing the other one brought it back to the normal level of roughly 15% um, CPU utilization. And this is something that we solely captured and we're able to quickly fix having the new Relic agent installed on our underlying applications. Um, working in DevOps for my team, it is important to understand the health of our environment um, at any time. And um, we drive an initiative called Operation Excellence. And this is one of the application dashboards um, that I've built for my team in which we can have a quick idea uh, if someone tells us that they have a hunch that something is fishy, um, whether we think our stack is good or not. Um, 
the principal approaches we have to operation excellence is we would like to be the first to know for that we install the apm agent on any language that new relic supports and that we use uh, we use synthetics checks to run um, periodical checks on our stack uh, be that user sessions that we uh, generate in the web be that api calls that we generate or things of that nature uh, we do graphs as you can see in this chart and uh, we are also able to alert our engineers um, based on our key performance indicator that we would like to monitor, be that load time, be that error rate or whatever. Uh, we would also like to be uh, able to quickly fix bugs and outages that we discover. Um, and there New Relic also helps us a lot by in the, uh, figuring out what is suddenly changing in the application when an error rate spikes or when load time goes up. Um, as you have seen in the previous charts we get a good insight in what is happening in our stack and their uh, new relic helps us a ton um, and um, also the fact that um, we send deploy markers in all of our apps we are able to identify whether an error rate suddenly spiked as a result of a deployment or whether a load time is suddenly out of sync uh, as a result of a deployment and the uh, third pillar in uh, our approach is always improving. Uh, just because things are good now doesn't mean that we can go forward and uh, have it better. And their insights, which is the uh, the tool which lets you create dashboards within your relic um, with a few um, SQL-like commands, uh, gives you the possibility to just visualize um, the data and the metrics that you gather from your stack and try to figure out where are the next possible iterations to make things even better. Um, we're also able to capture um, the AWS spend within New Relic and see um, which EC2 instances, for instance, are underutilized, which services are just expensive but maybe not used, and just cut down on cost there. And um, therefore, um, we can also see how the cost evolves over um, the course of years in terms of um, hardware need compared to um, business growth. Um, here are some AWS services which I would like to quickly point out um, because we use them a lot in our company and they are valuable to companies that may think about cloud adoption. One is the AWS Certificate Manager. You just get all of your certificates for free. They come at zero cost. Um, CloudFront is a possibility to bring your content closer to the customer. It serves as a content delivery network. And uh, if you try to resolve that problem with on-premise solutions, you have to have deep pockets. Um, CloudTrail is a full infrastructure audit log that can be enabled just with a few clicks. Also, this is something that is a ton of work if you try to achieve that on-premise. Um, AWS config allows you to set rules how your infrastructure has to set up in terms of which ports are open, uh, how is interconnectivity um, required, what tags resources need to have, and so on. Amazon Connect is a cloud-based telephony system, uh, which we use since a few months uh, with two of our global call centers, um, and so far it is really promising and we're rolling it out. Um, more globally and with more features. Um, Elastic Beanstalk is a nice handy service for companies which have zero cloud experience and not a large operations team. If you just have software developers that know how to run code, uh, sorry, that know how to write code but not how to run code, Elastic Beanstalk is phenomenal. You throw your code at Elastic Beanstalk and it takes care of your underlying infrastructure. Um, IAM is, um, is the AWS approach to identity management, be that for user or applications, and it allows, it manages who is allowed to do what. It's very handy and gives you a good way to limit what is being able to be done by your apps or by your users. AWS Lambda is um, an ability to run your code even without having infrastructure. If you have functions that are only called a couple of times a day or a couple of times an hour, AWS Lambda may be where you want to have it because it lets you run your code and generate cost only when you actually need it. 
Um, Lex is a voice recognition software, which we use in combination with Amazon Connect, our cloud-based telephony system, and enables our customers uh, to manage their bookings uh, in a fully automated way without the need to wait or answer to um, an agent. And then we have uh, last on the list, AWS WAF. It's a web application firewall. If you ever have been DDoS, you will understand the need of a web application firewall and this is a great tool. Um, so benefits of AWS and New Relic as um, Car Rentals has figured them out. Um, AWS scales within minutes to your needs. You need more, you, you run a TV campaign, AWS just provides the hardware to you. You don't have to um, go through long discussions with um, finance to have the infrastructure um, provisioned. It just is there as long as you need it and then it goes away again. Um, it performs better than on-premise as we've seen in the previous slides. Um, you can just re react to the business needs as quick as you want. It is globally available. You can tr prototype fast and you can succeed fast or fail fast, but you don't have to go through long cycles. And there are a ton of services at reasonable and low cost. New Relic is easy to adopt. Installing the agent is a few lines of code and you start getting insight in your stack. And from there on, you can just further evolve it. Um, it gives you deep insight into your stack. You see what is working well. You can see what is not working well and where your application spends time and throws errors. Um, our engineers love it as a debugging tool because it helps them understand what is not working well. Um, you can see performance tied to deployments and versions of your apps. Um, you can make your SLAs like error rates and time to run, load time and such um, alertable. And they also invite the customers to discuss roadmaps and uh, features. I've done that earlier this year in August. I was in Barcelona in their office um, and it was a great talk to see um, how they actually react to customers. Um, and AWS and New Relic enabled car rentals to be ahead of the game. Um, it saves us money and time, gives our developers the agility they need uh, with their new features and languages that they may come up. And um, we are able to serve our customers better with less errors and quicker um, and gives the business to focus on, um, on the business drivers rather than um, the infrastructure spend and my team personally um, spends less time maintaining um, the stack, but developing new features and infrastructure for everyone. Now I would like to hand back to George for a quick Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frank, and uh, thank you, Neil, for the great presentation. Um, we quickly go over some Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of questions here, but uh, please uh, keep on uh, sending your question and we'll try to address them. And also uh, uh, remember to stay connected at the end of the, the, the webinar to uh, quickly uh, complete uh, our survey. Now, the first question uh, to you, Frank, it's, uh, you know, what, what are the, the challenge or challenges, you know, you faced in this uh, cloud migration journey? And uh, how did you um, address address it or them? Uh, thanks for the great question. Um, first, my team or my company had zero cloud experts. We were all people that were either just software engineers or operating um, on-premise infrastructure or even just dealing with third parties. Um, and it was scary to the entire business, how could this be done? The approach we then took eventually was Elastic Beanstalk because we were mainly focused on our apps and we used Elastic Beanstalk to take care of our infrastructure at first. Um, that, that was a handy feature and this is why I pointed it out in my presentation and we took it from there. So basically also from an application perspective, we took a lift and shift approach. Um, what we also pushed first was our backend and not our frontend um, for two reasons. 
uh, first the front end was just being rewritten from scratch cloud-based anyway um, and the back end we deemed that we have the the better benefit um, if we are able to um, bring our computing time down um, by let's say 20 percent and as you can see we exceeded that by a large part um, but yeah it was a lot of ed internal educational um, an effort needed as well to tell we are confident in doing that. Um, we will not immediately um, come up with a solution, but in, in an iterative approach, we came up with the software running in the cloud. And then it was just test and learn and test and learn. Great, awesome. Uh, good to hear that, you know, so you've used some of the AWS services like Elastic Beanstalk to help uh, you know, mitigate with uh, some of the, the gap that you have um, in terms of uh, the skills in the team. Great. Uh, I have another question uh, to you, Frank. You know, uh, how has the adoption of uh, cloud and the improvement that you have delivered on the back of, uh, you know, this migration project changed the perception of IT within car rentals? Uh, thanks for that question as well. So, so um, kind of as I mentioned in the previous question, we were um, a software company that was focused on software. We were not necessarily great at managing infrastructure and hardware, um, but going to the cloud, um, we are now experts in infrastructure as well, and we are able to um, monitor and build our infrastructure cloud-based with good quality. Um, but that has not always been like that. So we had three engineering teams sitting in three different countries, which were working on their own stack. Um, by now we have engineering teams um, globally, which work on one stack and that includes infrastructure. So we are able to um, share our work across the world and across time zones, um, working on infrastructure and, and software, and not just solely focused in isolation on three different brands. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, one question um, that, that will go to uh, Neil. Um, obviously, monitoring, you know, we're capturing data, benchmarking was a key part of uh, you know, preparing the migration and obviously, you know, monitoring the cloud, you know, what single piece of advice would you provide in terms of uh, monitoring application that need migrating to the cloud? Uh, yeah, thanks for that, um, uh, George. Uh, we speak to a lot of customers that are um, uh, moving applications to the cloud or building applications uh, in the cloud. Um, and the one single piece of advice that I, I would give is you've always got to focus on the purpose of the application. What is the core, the core process, the business process that that application is delivering? Um, and then that is your critical KPI. Uh, so how, uh, how well are you delivering that, um, that service from a performance, availability and uh, functionality perspective um, right the way through that, uh, uh, that migration journey? Um, always keep your eye on that because at the end of the day I, I, I don't know whether any people on the call are familiar with things like lean methodologies etc um, but the value of what you deliver is in the eye of the consumer uh, and you have to be able to see um, that uh, that perspective you have to be able to see what they see uh, and you uh, you have to always be adding value everything that you do um, if it doesn't add more value to that uh, that consumer um, then it's just waste uh, so you need to you need to remove it. So that would be my one piece of advice. Focus on the key business process and what you're delivering to the end consumer um, through that application. Awesome. Thanks, for Neil. Um, this is one last question. Uh, obviously, uh, that uh, it's addressed to AWS. I suppose. What would you describe as a key value? that New Relic brings to the Cloud Migration Initiative over and above the solution available from AWS. Um, obviously, AWS, you know, provide this, the scale, the availability, all the, the value that uh, 
the cloud brings and the agility ability to innovate on top of the cloud and all the services that we provide the customer to help them move fast um, but you know ultimately you know we've had a great product that uh, you really uh, provide uh, you need to have an insight into um, the, the end user exp experience of your applications um, application in most cases are like black box and when you have you know, a tool that can actually, you know, uh, track your end user transaction all up the way down to the code level uh, and uh, allow you to proactively monitor your service. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a great value. And this is really uh, things that um, uh, New Relic uh, brings into the mix and complement very well what we do have uh, uh, in terms of uh, AWS services. So you've got that monitoring piece. And also, you know, when you're planning the cloud migration, you've got to make sure that you capture the data to make up your business case, you know, and uh, we as AWS don't have any visibility into what's happening on-prem. Uh, so that is really where Nuri comes in and adds significant value. And also, if you're talking about the hybrid, you know, model, where you still have part of, you know, some component of your services running on-prem, uh, then obviously, you know, a new relic uh, can, you know, provide a tool to be able to uh, to monitor those so that it does not impact on the performance and availability. Uh, to make sure that you know you are you stay within the SLAs and you can deliver to your customer the services with uh, you know proper performance. Um, I think uh, that concludes uh, today's webinars. Uh, please stay connected uh, to complete uh, you know our brief survey. And I want to thank you all for attending today's webinars. Thank you very much, uh, Neil and Frank for the great presentation. And uh, we look forward to supporting you in uh, your current and future project. Thank you again and have a great day.